falling from the clouds, a strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the skies like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays. seat, please. Let's pray together. For he, speaking of Christ, rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth and things in heaven, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Father, this morning our desire is to be pleasing to you in all things. And it begins by recognizing that you, above all, are over all things. So, Father, we readily admit that we cannot fathom how you've done all this. 
overwhelming thought that in the beginning you created the heavens and the earth. And yet you've given us enough information not to understand it, but to believe it. And so, Father, as, as we come to your word this morning, I pray that the result would be that we would, as the stars do, that we would bring glory to your name, that we would not look at this creation you've made and, and become used to it as if it's mundane and normal. Father, we pray that this morning that your word would go forth with such power that the saints are equipped and the lost are saved. And so may the gospel be clear. May it give hope to those who know you and eternal life to those who do not. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles, if you would. Genesis chapter 1. Your Genesis journal, page 9. So last week we began working through the book of Genesis. Uh, we didn't make it out of the first verse, and, but today we'll finish it. Uh, I probably could have went another uh, week, but uh, I don't think I would have done very good with that. Um, but I want to do a quick review of the overview of Genesis. It's important to know where you're at uh, in a book, and I know we're just starting, but uh, Genesis is broken down into two primary sections. And so sections one, or chapters 1 to 11 cover four events, and then chapters 12 to 50 cover uh, four people. And so let's see what you remember. Four events. What were the four events? What was the first one? Creation. And then the fall, flood, and good. So four events, creation, fall, flood, nations, and then four people. What were the four people? Who was the first one? Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and the last one? Joseph. Very good. So four events, four people. So we're in the first event and the first verse of the first chapter. And there is so much in this verse. You know, we said last week, this is the most controversial verse in all of the Bible. And the book of Genesis is the most attacked book in all of the Bible. And so it simply begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a standalone statement. It's not up for your opinion. It's not up for discussion. It's not up for debate or argument. Argument. And it doesn't really allow you to doubt it. It simply declares the existence, of, the existence of God before creation and his hand in creation. It doesn't tell us why he created. It doesn't tell us how he created. It doesn't even tell us when he created specifically. It just says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, there are all kinds of speculations that people will have from there, right? Some think... Well, I think God probably created because he was lonely and he was lacking. <laughs> Listen, God wasn't lonely or lacking. He needs nothing. You know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of people that when, when somebody passes away, they, they, they try to give hope. And one of the ways they try to give hope is they say, I think God probably needed them in heaven more than you needed them here. That's really bad theology. And it really paints God as a, as, as a selfish God, doesn't it? God needs nothing. I mean, he loves us, but he doesn't need us. And what 1-1 does is it tells me that there was something before there was a beginning. What was the something that existed before the beginning? God did. So creation is not when it all started. Creation was when God created the beginning. But before creation, God. Before there was anything, God. Everyone has a start. Everyone has a starting point except for God. Creation demands the existence of God, which is our first point this morning, Roman numeral number one. Creation demands a creator. So the fact that there is something demands that there was something. Even when there was nothing, there was something. Matter demands a maker. Life demands a life giver. Well, that something, before there was anything, is the great I am. He is the triune God. He is the uncaused cause. I like how Paul and, and John spoke of, of Jesus and his role in creation. 
John 1, verse 3, look what it says. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. We realize later that this word that became flesh was the very son of God. Colossians 1, verse 17, we read it in our pastoral prayer earlier. He, speaking of Christ, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Jesus is not a created being. Jesus was is part of the triune God who was before the beginning. Well, well, how do you know that? Because God said it, right? God said it, that settles it. Remember last week where I, I said that the creation story is not a scientific story, it's a theological one. Well, that's true even in, the, even in science. Science demands a creator. If you look at the law of biogenesis, it says that life comes from, guess what? Life. You can't get something from nothing. So design demands a designer. Intelligence demands an intelligent creator. Morality demands a moral life giver. There has to be an uncaused cause. You think, well, Mike, you're a pastor. You're supposed to say stuff like that. Well, in the New Scientist magazine, in an article entitled, The Beginning, What Triggered the Big Bang? Look what it says, should be on the screen. The quest to understand the origin of the universe seems destined to continue until we can answer a deeper question. Why is there anything at all instead of nothing? Right? Why is there anything at all? If, if, if design means you have to have a designer, if matter means you have to have a maker, why is there anything at all instead of nothing? Science agrees that life has to come from life. You cannot get something from nothing. Science doesn't go against the existence of God. Realistically, true science requires the existence of God. Now, we can argue about what happened. We can argue about how it happened. We can argue about why it happened. But the bigger question in all of this is, why do we have anything at all? Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Professor Richard Lewinton, he's a world leader in evolutionary biology. So he, he passed away now, but he was a world leader in evolutionary bi biography. He wrote a review of Carl Sagan's book called The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. Look what he says. He says, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. You see that? In spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, why would you do that? Look what he says. Because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Did you catch that? They're committed to a materialistic world, not because science proves it. They're committed to a materialistic world because any other explanation requires God. So they're going to clearly go against science because science says that matter requires a maker. Science says that life requires a life giver. Science says that creation demands a creator. They have to go against that because any other explanation requires, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> Richard Dawkins, you've heard of him, right? He wrote the book, The God Delusion. Look what he says. Of course it's counterintuitive that you can get something from nothing. Of course common sense doesn't allow you to get something from nothing. That's why it's interesting. It's got to be interesting in order to give rise to the universe at all. Something pretty mysterious had to give rise to the origin of the universe. I know that something personally. You see, the committed atheistic evolutionary scientists admit that there has to be something in order to have anything. 
But if you can't allow a divine foot in the door, in spite of the fact that science demands it and the scriptures proclaim it, then you actually get rid of any common sense at all. And so creation, point number one, demands a creator. Creation, number two, declares God's glory. You know, I've, I've had the great privilege of living in places um, that people vacation in. And what happens is you just get used to things. You know, I, I, there's, a, there's a road in Alaska called the Seward Highway. If you've never been on it, absolutely gorgeous. It's, it's called the, the, one of the most scenic drives in the world. Well, the first time I went through it, Sherry and I were together. We were uh, coming off an Alaskan cruise and heading from Seward to Anchorage. And they had a train that you could take. And the train was set up so that uh, the top half of the train was all glass. And so you could just, you could just look and see the, the scenery uh, above you and around you. And I got to tell you, it was gorgeous. I mean, you just looked around and, and you're just in awe of it. But we were on a train, so we couldn't stop and really enjoy it. Well, the next time I went through, I was asked to teach uh, close to Seward uh, in a church there. And, and so I brought Hannah with me, and we drove through it. This time we got to drive. You know what? We pulled over at every little stop that you could go to. Every time the road just kind of, oh, here's an open spot. Let's stop here. And we'd stop there, and we'd get out, and we'd just like, wow. Everywhere you look is just breathtaking. The next time through, I was with Sherry and the kids. And so for them, it, it, Hannah and I had seen it, of course, before, and, um, but they wanted to stop at every turn. And they wanted to stop and, and, and just take pictures. And you know what? Most of the time, I stayed in the car. I stopped being in awe of the glory of creation. Boy, I don't ever want to do that again. You just get kind of used to things, you know? And so I want to talk about four ways that creation declares the glory of God. Number one is in the vastness of his creation. If you've ever been out in, on the country, maybe camping or something, uh, on, on a clear, dark night, and, and you look up at the night sky, it's awesome, isn't it? Yeah, all the stars, and, and if... I know there's a, a in, in South Africa, a lot of times, you can actually see the Milky Way galaxy. I mean, it's just gorgeous. It, it looks like it's cloudy because there's so many stars up there. Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, the heavens are detailing the glory of God. And, this, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. That's, that's present tense, right? Right now, right now, the heavens are telling, are telling right now of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring right now the work of his hands. I mean, the stars are just screaming out. Like, look how glorious God is. I think we just get used to it. You know, I never do pictures and stuff like that up here, and I know I should. I got pictures today. That's exciting for me, <laughs> right? So, so the first one is, is the earth, right? Beautiful. God created that. And, and it seems so big, doesn't it? I'm heading to South Africa in November, and, and I'm thinking, oh, man, that flight. 16 hours on the way there, 18 hours on the way back. That's if everything goes right. 400-plus miles an hour. And it takes that long to get there. So the earth seems huge. Until you compare it, now look at the solar system we have. Look how small we are, Mercury, Venus, and then Earth. Some of you guys, especially in the back, probably can't even see that. I, I remember when Pluto was a planet. Anybody old enough to remember that? Yeah. Well, if we kept zooming out, here's a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. This isn't actually a picture, though, because we can't get to the edge of it. <coughs> But we're just a small part of that. We actually live towards the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, now consider this as this picture is up there, and I know it's, it's hard to see, but light travels at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. So if you're traveling at the speed of light, 
you would, at that speed, you could go around the earth six times in one second. Quick trip to Africa. <laughs> six times in one second, speed of light, right? You, you're, that's how fast you're going. So to get from, from one side of the Milky Way galaxy to the other side of the Milky, Ga Milky Way galaxy, you go, well, how, how, if you were traveling at the speed of light, how many years would it take you to get there? Or how many days? 105,700 years. To go from one side of the Milky Way galaxy to the other side of the Milky Way galaxy, going the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, six times around the Earth, one second, that speed is going to take you 105,700 years. That's just our galaxy. In our galaxy, there are anywhere from 100 to 200 billion stars, depends on who you ask. The Hubble telescope recently provided evidence that there are 125 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Creation, the vastness of creation, declares the glory of God. Isaiah said, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Listen, we have eight children and seven grandchildren. I know their names. Birthdays, I got my kids down. Sherry's got the rest of them. How many names of stars are there that God has to remember? I mean, there's 100 to 200 billion stars in our galaxy, and then there's 150 other galaxies out there, 150 billion other galaxies out there. And in his, in his omniscience, he doesn't even have to think about it. He doesn't have to go, oh, let me think here. Oh, that's, he knows, just like that. He knows. But he doesn't just know the, the name and intimate detail of every star that exists or has existed or will exist. He knows you intimately. He knows the intimate details of your life. So what's too big for God? Is there any problem that you have now or ever will have that's too big for God? What might seem overwhelming and impossible to you is not overwhelming and impossible to God. And the beauty of the gospel is that God is not just this huge entity outside of us. God has taken up residence inside every Christian. And he has promised, I will not leave you as orphans, but instead I'm going to abide with you and I'm going to abide in you. 1 Peter 5, knowing this, 1 Peter 5 says, Therefore, because of this, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. If he can hold all of this together, I mean, don't you think he can handle those things in your life that cause you to lose sleep, cause you to get angry, cause you to be anxious? It's the vastness of his creation that should give you confidence of who God is. Where else do we see the glory of God? Number two, in the design of his creation. <clears throat> We're in this pattern in Florida where it just rains every day. I used to love it when we lived in Clearwater because at four o'clock every day it would just pour down rain. All the tourists would leave the beach and 15 minutes later, you got the whole beach to yourself. This morning, I mean, there's rain this morning. And in Job, Job says that, that rain, as normal as it is for us, he says rain is a great and unsearchable wonder of God. I mean, Job, move to Florida. I mean, every day, four o'clock, it just rains. I mean, monsoon kind of thunderstorm rains. Job says, chapter five, but as for me, I would seek God and I would place my cause before God who does great and unsearchable things. 
wonders without number, such as rain on the earth and sends water on the fields. And you go, what's the big deal about rain? What's so great about rain? So John Piper in his book, Taste and See, Savoring the Supremacy of God in All of Life, he just paints this picture that is fa- it's fantastic. I actually, if I would have thought about it, I thought if we had two people just to do a little skit together up front, this would be the perfect skit to do. But he says, picture yourself as a farmer in the Near East. You're far away from any river or stream. You have a few wells that keep the animals and family supplied with water, but if the cop- crops are going to grow and the family is to be fed from month to month, then water has to come on the field from another source. And so you say, but from where? The sky. The sky? So water is just going to come out of the clear blue sky. Well, not exactly. Water will have to be carried in the sky from the Mediterranean Sea over several hundred miles and then be poured out from the sky onto the fields. Carried? Well, how much does water weigh? Well, one inch of rain on one square mile mile of farmland is nearly 18 million gallons of water. Well, how much does 18 million gallons of water weigh? Well, about 145 million pounds that have to be carried. (laughs) That's heavy. So how does it get up into the sky and stay there if it's so heavy? Well, it gets up there by evaporation. Really? What does that mean? Well, it means that the water sort of stops being water for a while so it can go up and not down. Well, then how does it go down? Well, condensation happens and the water starts becoming water again by gathering around little dust particles between 0.00001 centimeter and 0.0001 centimeters. That's small. What about all the salt? Isn't the Mediterranean full of salt water? And all that salt water would kill the crops. Well, the salt has to be taken out. So the sky picks up a billion pounds of water from the sea, takes out the salt, carries it for 300 miles, and just dumps it on the farm? Well, it doesn't dump it. If it dumped 145 million pounds of water on the farm, the wheat would be crushed. So the sky dribbles the billion pounds of water in little drops. And the drops have to be big enough to fall for a mile or so without evaporating and small enough to keep from crushing the wheat. Well, how do all the microscopic specks of water that weigh 145 million pounds get heavy enough to fall? Well, that's called coalescence. That's when specks of water start bumping into each other and join up and get bigger. And when they get big enough, they fall. Just like that? Well, not exactly because they just bounce off each other instead of joining up if there were no electrical field present. What? Never mind, just take my word for it. I'll take Job's word for it. And at four o'clock every day we go, oh, it's raining. God has so brilliantly designed his creation so that it rains on field without destroying the fields. Or we have this oxygen that we breathe. You've been breathing it all morning and you didn't even think about it. Our hearts beat, pump, it pumps beat after beat after beat and we don't even have to try. You'll know if it stops though. Even now, gravity is keeping you sitting down, not flying away. Why? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so you have these beautiful things like full moons and sunsets and sunrises and shooting stars and and a baby smile. And you know what they're all saying? We serve an awesome God. Forgive us for looking at creation as if it's mundane and normal. I mean, does anybody else think it's kind of weird that we, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide, But if we breathe in carbon dioxide, then we can't really breathe. Like he takes care of those details. He takes care of the details so that if we we get too close to the sun, we burn up. And if we get too far away, we freeze. And so he keeps us just on the perfect distance and the perfect access. Like he's the eternal God. He created all things in the beginning and he holds all things together. And he's the uncaused cause because in the beginning God created in perfect order of the heavens and the earth. 
And so we see his glory, number three, in the method of his creation. You know, for two weeks now, we've harped on the fact that God created everything. <clears throat> what we haven't done is talked about how he created everything. And so the Hebrew word here uh, means that he created out of nothing. In the Latin, it's ex nihilo, out of nothing. Which means that there wasn't no big bang, even if you try to, to combine evolution and, 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 and the Bible, and you say, well, then God was the big banger. No, he wasn't that, because that would have required two atoms to come together first. But he just spoke it into existence. He literally created out of nothing. And when we create, we're, we're so much different than that, right? Like we, we build everything that we have because of something that we already have. Like we have materials that we use to create, whereas God created out of nothing. I mean, just think about the, the, the people that we would say are, are, that we would credit with being the most creative minds in our lifetime. My lifetime, the first person we'll have them here is, is Walt Disney. So Walt Disney, what did he create? Mickey Mouse. Out of nothing? No. He just had a mouse and he made it into a big rat. <laughs> he modified what God created. He didn't create out of nothing. He modified God's creation. What about the Star Wars? I know some lovers in here. I'm surprised you didn't yell just now when I said that. George Lucas, right? Yoda. What did George Lucas do with Yoda? Well, he modified a created being's ears, made him larger, he cut off some fingers, and he made him speak with really bad grammar. Sorry, EJ, I know that hurt when I said that. God created out of nothing. He didn't modify anything to get what we have today. He literally spoke the world into existence. You can't even say he did it out of thin air. He created thin air. Right? There was no material to modify. There were no elements to join together. Hebrews 11, look what it says, verse 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. It has to be by faith because we can't fathom that there was anything. We can't fathom, sorry, the before before there was anything. He literally created everything out of nothing. Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. I, I don't know how it happened. I mean, maybe he just said, universe. And the universe just appeared with galaxies in perfect orbit. I mean, what does that do to you when you just think? That, that's all he did. He just said, universe, and it, it all happened. The whole six days, six uh, ages, that all argument. Listen, it could have been six seconds. Paul thinks about that. And look what he says in Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. It's unfathomable. And if you're sitting here and, and you're just blown away by it all, 107,500 years at the speed of light to get from one side of the galaxy, I'm sorry, yeah, the galaxy to the other. And you go, yeah, I get that. You do not. You can't fathom that. It's unfathomable. Well, listen, if that's you, you're just going, I, I don't get it. I'm in awe of it. You're in great company because Paul says that's the wisdom and the genius of God. You can't measure it no matter how hard you try. But just because you can't measure it doesn't mean that you can't believe it. We read last week from Romans that looking around at creation, that's all the evidence we need to know that there's a God. And to come to any other conclusion is to suppress the truth of God. He didn't do it over billions of years. Six consecutive 24-hour days. And I'll show you why uh, in the next couple weeks. And so God's glory, we see, is in, his vastness, in the vastness of his creation. 
We say, see God's glory in the, in the design and the details of his creation. And we see God's glory in number four, in the identity of the creator. And so the name that, that's used for God here is not the frequently used name Jehovah or, or YHWH. Some would say Yahweh. The first time, first verse, first book of the Bible that God chooses to make his name, name known in Scripture, he uses the name Elohim. Elohim. It's, it's, a, it's a name that is used for God 2,330. 2,310 times in, in, in the Old Testament. And remember, names mean something in the Bible. And so El, El means God. And so you, you might have heard the, uh, like El Shaddai, God the sufficient one. Emmanuel, what's Emmanuel mean? God with us. Okay, so here it's the name Elohim. Elohim means the infinite God, the all-powerful God. Interestingly, this name is plural. Okay, in the Hebrew language, it's called a majestic plural. And you go, wait a second, if it's plural, then is, does this imply polytheism? No, because then you'd have to throw away the rest of the Bible to get to that. There's only one God. So what are our options? In the first verse of the first book in the Bible, we see an argument already for the triunity of God. And you see it later in, in verse 26. God, Elohim, says, let us make man in our image, plural. Imagine the mysteries that this is. Remember what Paul says that, 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 God, that he's shown us now as believers, he's, he's shown us the mysteries of Christ. These great mysteries of old. This was one of those mysteries. And we're going to speak about this more in the days ahead. So the question becomes, how do we apply it? How do we apply, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? Well, I think there are at least four ways that we can apply it. Okay? Because of the greatness of God in creation, number one, focus on that which is eternal. Focus on that which is eternal. Remember, remember we said last week, well, I'll just ask you, so who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses did, right? That's an important thing to understand. Moses wrote the Pentateuch. But Moses didn't just write the Pentateuch. He also wrote a psalm as well. Look at Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so Moses says here, before, there was any, before anything was anything, God was God. He's the everlasting one. He's the self-existent one. He has no needs that, that need to be met from outside of himself. I like what Steve Lawson said. He said, God did not create anything because there was a hole in his holiness that needed to be filled. And what I've found is that the bigger your view of God is, the smaller your view of your problems are. And you know, what, you know what you're focused on, about what makes you happy or holy or angry or anxious. And the more you focus on the greatness of God, then the more your faith is going to be strengthened and the more the things of the world are going to fade away. And so the bigger your God is, the smaller your problems are, and the smaller your God is, the bigger your problems are. And so we have to focus on that which is eternal. Look at Colossians 3. How do we do that? Therefore, he says, therefore if, and you can say the word since here, therefore since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Set your mind above. If God can do all of this with all these galaxies and, and he chose to come here, live as a man, die for you and then to uphold you and care for you and never leave you and reside inside of you. Don't, don't you think that we don't need to worry? Well, how do, I, how do I do that? How do I keep my mind focused on the things of God? 
daily time in God's word. Daily time. And I'm not talking about like a verse a day keeps the you know, devil away type thing. I'm like, serious, like spend time in the word of God. If you're not used to that, get used to it. If it's hard, good. Everything worthwhile is hard. But you're going you're gonna to become whatever your mind is filled with. So spend time daily in God's word. And then if, when you run across something, you go, man, I really need that. Memorize that. Memorize scripture. Spend a long time memorizing scripture. You know, I don't really memorize like I used to. Fine. Then you got to work harder at it. Make daily decisions to filter out those things that take the focus off the things of God. It's moment by moment decisions you have to make. I like how Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 8 Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on those things. Dwell. Let your mind marinate on those things because you're going to become whatever you dwell on. And so point number one is focus on that which is eternal. Number two, trust in the wisdom of God. Just because God is powerful does not mean that you can trust him. Right? Just because he's powerful does not mean that you can trust him. That's why the scriptures don't just focus on the power of God in creation, but they also focus on the wisdom of God in creation. Look at Psalm 104, verse 24. Oh Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. Jeremiah 10, verse 12. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding he stretched out the heavens. If you go, I, I don't know how he did it. Good, you're not God. You won't know how he did it. Proverbs 3, verse 19. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens, and by his knowledge, the deeps were broken up and the skies drip with dew. And so the things that are too difficult for you are not too difficult for God. The things that confuse you, God's not confused. The things that worry you, they don't worry God. I mean, think about this. The atheist believes that nothing plus no one equals everything. Nothing plus no one equals everything. It takes more faith to be an atheist than it is to be a Christian. Point number three, remember the faithfulness of God. Jesus makes the case that our worry really stems from a heart that's, that, that doesn't believe. Worry says that God is not acting in a good way towards us. I like what Tim Keller said about this. He said, worry is not believing God will get it right. And bitterness is believing God got it wrong. Okay, worry is not believing God will get it right. And bitterness is believing that God got it wrong. And when we forget the faithfulness of God, we lean towards worry. We lean towards fear. Does that help at all? I, I met with somebody recently, and he, he said, man, I'm, I'm beating myself up about this. And I said, does that help? Does worry help? No. My pastor used to say, there's two things you can worry about. He says, or two different types of worry. He says, you can, you, you can worry about the things you can do something about. And if you're worried about that, then what should you do? Do something about it. He says, then you're worried about things that you can do nothing about. Well, if you can't do anything about it then, don't worry about it. I know it sounds really simple, and then you say things like, no, I'm worried that I'm worrying. <laughs> but his creation proves his faithfulness. Before there was anything, the triune God had already predetermined that the second member of the Trinity would become a man before man was created. All three persons of the Trinity would then cooperate to work to that end. It was a settled fact in heaven before the beginning. Acts 2, verse 22, look what 
uh, Peter says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over, what's it say? By the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God. Boy, don't you just love the but gods in the Bible? But God raised them up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. And so this mass of God with omnipotent power and with infinite wisdom, he did that for you. And if he did that for you, then what shall you do in response? Point number four, commit to serving others. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second one is like it. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. And so when you look up and you see the magnificence of God, it should spur you on to to thank him by serving others. Ephesians 2 verse verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You can't, you can't brag about being saved. You're saved by grace through faith. And then the next verse, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So it's not just, oh, wow, look at this wonderful creation. Yes, look at this wonderful creation. Look how awesome a God that we serve. And then you serve. Use your gifts. We had a fun Sunday school this morning. We were talking about the local church and the importance of the local church in the life of a believer. It's not just to come and listen. You know, I think one of the tragedies of COVID, has, there's a bunch of them, but one of them in the church sense is that people think you can just watch church on TV and that's church. This is church here. This is right here. It's, it's after the service. I see somebody talking to somebody. I know, wow, they're really struggling. I'm glad they're talking to that person. Next thing I know, look over, they're praying together. Man, that's beautiful. I see people who are, who are struggling and hurting, and I see them getting comforted. I mean, we've got this whole group of people, all of you are involved to some level, where we've got to be out of here by 12 o'clock and stacking chairs and pulling up stages and getting all this stuff up so they can play basketball in a few minutes. Serving one another. Caring for one another, inviting people to lunch, admonishing one another as needed, forgiving one another, greeting one another with a holy kiss. Like all of these things is is all part of our gathering together. You can't do that watching TV on the way to the beach. You can't do that just listening to a podcast on a radio. We were created for good works. And, and the outgrowth, the, the one another's, love one another, care for one another, comfort one another, all of those, the context is in the local church. It's in the gathering of believers. And we were created to do good works. But listen, if you've never been saved by faith, right? By grace, by the grace of God through faith, the first good work to do is to trust Christ. Is to place your faith, your hope in the work that Jesus has done for you. And if that's already true of you, well, I hope you found a ministry to serve in. And for the record, we have lots of needs, a lot of needs within the church. Well, where can you start? Well, help with tearing down today. Josh isn't here. He does so much up here. In fact, it would even be good to relieve Josh from some of that when he's here. Because a lot of people want to talk to him. But he's busy doing all this stuff. Maybe attend a Bible study or a small group this week. Come to the prayer meeting on Saturday. Come to the the Church of the Clusters next week. And and when you come to these things, don't, don't just look and judge it based on what's in it for you. Look at it and go, well, how can I serve? What are the desires, the passions, the the dreams that I have? What are the gifts that God has given me so that I can serve other people? Why would I do that? Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He gave his son for you. 
and he prepared work for you. I mean, in the next few weeks, and I don't know how many, it's been taking a long time to get these chairs, 150 more chairs. We're going to get swallowed up in this place unless you bring people you know. And so who are you going to bring with you? Who will you start praying for today? Who will you reach out to? The work was already prepared. We just saw that in Ephesians 2. And now we have to walk in them. Let's pray together. In the beginning, you created the heavens and the earth. And what a creation you created. God, thank you that from one verse in the Bible we can see so much and we haven't even scratched the surface of who you are. God, we can't fathom. We admit with Paul that it is unfathomable. And yet, God, you've given us enough to have hope and to believe. And so I pray for those this morning who maybe came in here and they don't know Christ. I pray that today they would trust you with their eternity. That they would believe in Jesus, put their hope and their trust in Jesus and the work that he did to pay the penalty that their sin deserved. And I pray for those believers that are in here. God, give us a work to do together. That we would be a fully functioning church. That all the members working together for one goal, and that's to bring honor and glory to your name. And so God, put people in our minds now that we can begin praying for and reaching out to and inviting to come. Not that we would just have a whole bunch more people in the church, but that those without Christ might come to know him and those who know Christ will be faithful to serve him. And so be glorified in all that we do. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together as we conclude our service this morning. i
Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a good Sunday.